4 verse 6, Ezekiel said, I will lay on you a day for each year. Now understand that Daniel was a prophet, correct? Jesus said, Daniel the prophet, right? Ezekiel was also a prophet. His book is just before Daniel. When God was talking to Ezekiel in chapter 4, verse 6, he said to him just before that, I want you to do this for 40 days. And he went to do this, and then he, God said, now when you do this, you're doing it for 40 days, because each day represents a year. So in the Bible, in a prophecy like this, where this time comes in, it is a day is equivalent to a year. Now, this is where you have to trust me. Now, I don't want you to trust me, but you have to trust me. Does that make any sense? But don't trust me all the way until I prove it from the Bible. Then you can trust me, because you can trust the Bible. What this is really saying is that 2,300 prophetic days equals 2,300 literal years. If the Bible gives us the starting point then for this 2,300 years, then we could easily calculate the ending point. Now don't come to the wrong conclusion, because tonight I will help you to understand what that ending point is or isn't. If the Bible gives us this, it will also give us some marker points along the way that are very revealing and the focal point of tonight's study. Is there any more information in the book of Daniel about this time prophecy? In Daniel chapter 8, that's what we see is that uh, Gabriel simply tells him about the ram and the goat, but he doesn't say anything to him about the 2300 days. At the end of Daniel chapter 8, I'm not going to take the time to turn there, but if you're in your Bible, you can see it. Daniel, in the last verse, faints, and he was sick because I, he said, was astonished or amazed by the vision, but no one understood it. He understood about the, he understood about the ram, that was clear, and he understood about the goat, that was clear, but he didn't understand that 2300 days. Now, you have to think like Daniel. Daniel was a Jew. Daniel was a captive in Babylon. The sanctuary was in Jerusalem. The sanctuary had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel is now thinking about this, and he knows that as long as the sanctuary is in ruins, God is being dishonored by that experience. So he's thinking the sanctuary will be cleansed. Oh, that must mean the sanctuary will be rebuilt. And so that's what he was trying to understand. And he was so upset at the end of the vision because Gabriel didn't tell him the answer. And he wanted to know. Now, I'd love to go into the details, but in chapter 9, the first few verses, Daniel is praying to, uh, to, the, to God again and asking for help to understand about the sanctuary. And God again sends Gabriel to him in verse in uh, verse 20. You begin to see this happen, um, where he says he was speaking and praying. I'm in chapter 9. Did I tell you that? Daniel chapter 9, I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. And yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision at the beginning, back in chapter 8, is the first time he met Gabriel. Gabriel had given him that information, and now Gabriel comes back. And the first thing that Gabriel does is start to talk to him about time. Now, what I can't do this evening is go into all the verses that come here, but I want you to follow along with me up on the screen, because... As we go through this, you're going to be able to see that the information that Gabriel, Gabriel gave to Daniel predicted the exact date of Christ's baptism, the exact date of Christ's crucifixion, and the exact date when the gospel would no longer be given just to the Jewish people, but it would be given to the entire world. In Daniel 9, verse 24, time is spoken of. And it says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Well, part of the question is, who are the people, who are Daniel's people, and what is his city? Well, he came from Jerusalem. That was the central uh, place of the Jewish kingdom. And his people were the Jews. So that's very easy. 
So Daniel is being told this by Gabriel. Then he says that 70 weeks are determined or cut off for your people and for your holy city. The word in Hebrew means cut off. It means separate, off, from. <coughs> off of what? What was it cut off from? It's cut off from the 2300 days that were before or the 2300 years. And he says they are for your people and for your city. God is helping Daniel to understand that he, God, is going to give the Jewish people a certain amount of time to make a decision for God, to follow God as God wanted, uh, wanted them to follow him. Stay with the time part. It's 70 weeks. 70 weeks has, has how many days? How many days are there in a week? Seven. If seven days in a week. So if there's 70 weeks, all we have to do is take 7 times 70, and we come up with 490 prophetic days. That would be 490 years of time. <coughs> so now, if we can understand when this begins, we can see where this 490 years goes. He said in Ezekiel 4, 6, I've given you a day for a year, so we know this is years. And then we begin to say, all right, so when is this whole prophecy going to begin? And the answer is, know, and under, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem is what Gabriel said to Daniel. Daniel was told that when the decree comes from the king to establish and rebuild Jerusalem, then the time prophecy will be given. When did that happen? Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, but Gabriel comes and says that when the command to rebuild is given, then you will know that the prophecy, this time prophecy, has started. And then he says in verse 25, we'll come back and we'll get that piece in a minute, in verse 25, and he says, from that time when it begins, until Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, I know I'm going over this quickly, but you can review it in your Bible later. But I want you to catch this. Until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Time from the beginning of this prophecy to Messiah. Well, who was Jesus? <coughs> Jesus was the Messiah, wasn't he? Amen. And so this prophecy is actually telling us that... This prophecy says that when this comes to fulfillment, the Messiah will be there. So, the question is, when was the decree given to rebuild Jerusalem? This was in 457 B.C. that the decree was given. Sorry, it's a little off the screen there. But it was given in 457 B.C. That was a long time ago. You and I weren't there. So we have to go back in historical records to find that information. When we go back into the historical records and the best archaeology that's out there, you find that it was 457 B.C. that this prophecy began. Then we go 69 weeks or 483 years from the 490, and you'll see how this fits together here in just a moment. We also find, by the way, marked down is Ezra chapter 7. And in Ezra chapter 7, you will find where the decree is given to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. And, uh, and that's an important part. Thank you for staying with me. I know I'm giving you a lot of details all at once. 2300 days, 457 B.C., going for 490 years. Is the first part that God told Daniel through Gabriel would be for the Jews. But the next part that comes is an anchor date that's important to us as well. I want to share that with you. That is with Messiah the Prince. So again, in Daniel 9, 25, it says there would be these seven weeks and 62 weeks. Messiah, by the way, means the anointed one. That's what the word means. In the Bible, in a prophecy like this, the details are critical. Messiah is the anointed one. What Daniel was being told was that 
from 457 BC until the time when the Messiah would be anointed and identified would be 400 and, I mean, sorry, seven weeks and 62 weeks. It would be after that 69 week period of time. Jesus was anointed at his baptism. Remember when he was baptized? The Spirit of God came down as a dove and anointed him at his baptism. The interesting part to all of this is that when these things took place, we are not left in doubt as to what the time actually was. <coughs> and I want you to be able to see that. The date time here is 457 to AD 27 is 483 years. Just one thing you need to know is there never was a year when there never was a year. So you can't just simply do simple math. You have to realize that, you know, when you and I were in school, when we had to subtract minus numbers, did you hate that? Anybody hate that? I hated that because it was so confusing. But here we've got minus numbers, there's zero, no zero year, so it comes out to AD 27 in 483 years later. Is this when Jesus was baptized? There are not a lot of dates given in the Bible, but Luke gave the date of Jesus' baptism. We find it in Luke chapter 23, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 3, verse 21. He said, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. In the beginning of that chapter, it says, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, Caesar. We go back and we go in history, we find out when the 15th year of Tiberius, Caesar was, and that was 27 AD. Fantastic to be able to understand this. The Bible told the Jews, told the people, exactly when the Messiah would come, to the very year when he would come. Then it says in Daniel verse chapter 9, verse 26, that after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. What does that mean? Well, simply it means that the Messiah would be crucified. How would he be, uh, when would he be crucified? Well, the Bible tells us that that he would confirm the covenant with many for one week for one week after the time of his baptism he would con God would confirm the covenant for one week with the people remember God said you would have 490 years he told Daniel the Jews would have 490 years from 457 BC we come to 4 to AD 27 with the baptism of Jesus and then there's still one week left or seven years left when was Jesus when did he confirm the covenant with one uh, for, for the people for in uh, one week in verse 27 it says in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and to the offering never again when Jesus died would a lamb be offered because Christ was the lamb to be offered as the sacrifice. Amen. Offerings in uh, the sacrifice and the offerings in the earthly temple came to an end when Jesus was sacrificed, and that was also done right on time. I want to review this quickly. The decree goes forth in 457. 483 years later takes me to uh, to 8027. In the middle of that one prophetic week, three and a half days or three and a half literal years later, we find that Jesus uh, uh, is uh, cut off or crucified. And that was A.D. 31. We know historically that that is when Jesus died. Understanding Christ's work and mission helps us to understand even better how well these days fit. You see... Here's what I want you to catch from this tonight. Daniel 9 is about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You may say, Neil, this is really interesting, but what difference does it really make to me? Why do I need to understand this? I want to give you some reasons, and then I want to share another piece that will be an important piece to the total puzzle tonight. Jesus said this in Matthew 26, 28. He said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. 
The death of Jesus on the cross <coughs> was so that my sins and your sins can be forgiven. Jesus wants us to know there's hope for the future because even though I'm a sinner, I receive forgiveness because of what Jesus did on the cross. That's what this weekend is all about. It's about what Jesus did for me and Jesus wants me to understand that. But there's even more that he wants me to understand. It's just like the devil to take a precious pro uh, prophecy that speaks about Jesus' blood and destroy it and trying to point it at himself. And some people have tried to take Daniel chapter 9 and point it to, to a whole different direction. But when you look at the time prophecy, it's abundantly clear. This whole prophecy is talking about Jesus. It zeroes in exactly on when Jesus would die. And it, it tells us that crucified Christ was crucified exactly on time. He was the Messiah. The Bible is that accurate. In Galatians chapter 4, notice what the Bible in the New Testament says about time. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son. Why does it keep talking about time? Because God had told the people of Israel when the Messiah would come. But when He came, they weren't ready. Time was important because it reveals what God wanted us to understand about something critical. Time is fulfilled, the Bible, so Mark says. The time is fulfilled. Romans, um, Paul said, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Time, 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 again and again, because time is important to God so that He can give us confidence in the Bible and understand what He wants us to know even for our own time. Jesus confirmed the covenant He made from the beginning of time with His blood. When, the, when Jesus died on the cross, Matthew tells us that the sacrifices ended because the sanctuary veil was torn open from top to bottom. A, a, a magnificent miracle because from the top to the bottom could not have been done by human hand. It had to have been done by an angel. Never again would they, the Jews, or we, look to an earthly temple. Jesus Christ had died on the cross. He had shed His blood. And the blood of bulls and goats would no longer be used as a way of bringing sacrifice for sin. The sacrifice for sin was Jesus on the cross. He was baptized on time and He was crucified on time because He was the Messiah and He is the Messiah. Christ would die. He would also be resurrected. After His death on the cross, He was buried and He was resurrected. We'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Jesus had died, but the work was not done according to Daniel chapter 9. It said there was still three and a half years left. And what happened in the three and a half years of time God was trying to help the Jews to accept the fact that Jesus was their Messiah. But finally they stoned Stephen in A.D. 34 to death. And the gospel message went just not just to the Jews, but also to the rest of the world as well. A.D. 34 marks three things. Stephen's speech that Christ was the Messiah was, was what he spoke that led to his stoning. The Jewish high priest rejected Stephen's reasoning that Jesus was the Messiah. The gospel then went to the to the Jews and I mean to the to the uh, to the Gentiles. That's what I'm trying to say. All right, now I want you to catch these points that are up on the screen. Two important points from Jesus' comments that we had earlier was that the prophet Daniel had something important to say to us, and that time is important to God. What does this all mean? It means that the Jews should have known the time when the Messiah was to come. They should have been ready for His arrival. They should have embraced Him as their long-awaited Messiah. That was a critical prophecy. They should have been ready. But now I need to share something else with you. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly tonight. 
It's going to be another prophecy out of Daniel. But you can review this on your own. It's a very easy one to follow. The story is very clear. I'm going to give you a few of the highlights. Because Daniel, again, about 600 years before Christ, um, was serving the king Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream one, day, one night. And in that dream, he saw something that disturbed him. He woke up in the morning, according to Daniel chapter 2, verse 1, and his spirit was troubled. And, and he didn't wake up, he woke up right then, and he, he couldn't sleep anymore. The king was so deeply troubled that he did what kings do. He called his wise men to explain what the dream meant. And so they came to them, him, and said, O king, live forever, tell your servants the dream, and we will be happy to give you the interpretation. These men were wise. Um, they were smart. I'm not sure how wise they were. You'll see about that in the story in a moment. Nebuchadnezzar was angry when they said this to him, because he responds by saying, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me the interpretation. He couldn't remember the dream, and he said, even if I did, and I told it to you, you'd just make up some story. But if you can tell me what the dream was, then I know you really do know what the interpretation is. And they said, no man can tell that to the king. They were right, no man could. And so the king said, fine, you're dead. And he gave commands to his guards to take all the wise men and slay them all. Well, they had a lot of wise men, and they went around looking for all the wise men, even the ones who weren't there. And one of them was Daniel and his three friends. Daniel said, what's the, what's the big deal? Why are we doing this? And the uh, executioner explained it to Daniel. Daniel said, hang on, let me go talk to the king. So everything went on hold. But Daniel went to the king and said, give me a chance, O king, I will be happy to give you the answer because the God of heaven can give you that answer. So Daniel went to bed, and that night, in a dream, he got the answer. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 23, it says, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might. Where did he get it from? God. He got it from God. In Daniel 2, verse 28, he went to the king, and this is what he told the king. He said, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the... Latter days. In the... Latter days. I want you to notice that. Does that sound familiar to you at all? What did we see in Daniel chapter 8? We wanted you to know what is going to be in the last days. What does he say here? The latter days. You will find in the book of Daniel that, that phrase is repeated in several prophecies re repeatedly. It's an important focus for you and me. Because you see, as we will see tonight, he's speaking to you and me. Let me explain that because it will become very clear. Daniel said, King, God wants you to know what will be in the latter days. And so in verse 31, he says this, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. Here's a king who a few nights, a night or two before, had had this dream, and he can't remember what it is. Daniel says you saw an image, and Nebuchadnezzar's mind begins to recall, because God is letting him remember that now, what it was he saw. Now he knows that Daniel knows and that God has told him what they had seen and now he knows he can trust what Daniel is going to tell him. Does that make sense? <laughs> so Daniel continues and said, the image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet of iron and partly of clay. You see an artist's conception up on the screen of what that might have looked like. He goes, continues and says, You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image in its feet of iron and clay, and broke them to pieces. The iron and clay and the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed together, became like a chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. That was what he saw. The 
The stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Daniel told this to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar said, wow, that's what I saw. But Daniel doesn't stop there. You and I don't have to be wondering what it was that that meant. It was symbolism again. What did it mean? Daniel says, this is the dream. Now I will tell you. You, O king, are a king of kings. You are this head of gold. Now I want you to follow what happens here. First of all, he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are represented in this image by the head of gold. That's what you are. Then he says, uh, and he represents that, and that represented the kingdom of Babylon. Because we see what happens next is it goes to another kingdom. So catch this part as we go by it. Babylon lasted from 605 to 539 B.C. And then Daniel tells him, the chest and arms of silver, they are another kingdom. I already told you what came after Babylon because we found it in Daniel chapter 8. It was the Medes and Persians. They were the next kingdom to come along. The story of how these kingdoms transition from one to the other is fascinating in relationship to the details that come here in this prophecy, but I don't have time to go over them another time. You'll enjoy that another time. After you shall arise another kingdom. So, after Babylon, after Medo-Persia, comes another kingdom. And a third one of bronze, which shall rule over the earth. Babylon ruled over the earth. Another king came along and took over, the Medes and Persians. Another king came over and took over after them. That was the kingdom of Greece. And that is historical fact. Go back to your record books. Go back to your history books. Babylon was followed by Medo-Persia, was followed by Greece. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 40, the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, and we know that was Rome. Rome lasted from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D., we're getting closer to our time, and was represented by the legs of iron. Then Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, he says, whereas you saw the feet and the toes, part of part is clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Now you can't quite see it down here, but you can see there's a mixture down at the bottom in the drawing down here or in the artist's conception. Gold, silver, bronze, iron, then iron mixed with clay. He says this is important because iron uh, and clay don't mix together. It represents a divided kingdom for what would happen. Now, you know, if somebody was just making this dream up and was predicting the future, you would expect them to say there would be one kingdom, two kingdoms, three kingdoms, four kingdoms, five kingdoms, six, seven, eight. Kingdom, 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 kingdom. But Daniel doesn't do that because God could see the future. And God was telling him that the world will not be the same as it was before. It was ruled by Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, then Rome. But then Rome fell apart. And the rest of the world was controlled by multiple kingdoms. We know that from history. I can't go into all of that. But just as predicted, the world has never been united again under one king. There have been lots who've tried. But they've all failed miserably. Even one of them said, it is God that is preventing me from being able to do that, to be the ruler. And you know what? He's right. He was absolutely right. So Daniel continues on and says, as you saw, iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will clay. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. They will mingle with the seed of men. They shall not be able to adhere to one another. I think we just did that. They will mingle with the seed of men, and they will not hear. We did just do that too. <laughs> divided Europe is represented, and I say divided Europe and the world is represented by this part of the prophecy from A.D. 476 um, to the present. The feet of iron and clay mixed together. And even when Europe tries to unite together, things like Brexit comes along, and they can't even unite and stay together in that environment. Because the Bible says it wouldn't happen. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Europe. Then what happens? In this prophecy, Daniel saw 
a stone come along, cut out without hands, which struck the image of the feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Daniel says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It shall stand forever. There is hope on the way. I want you to know it is God who is in control of the last kingdom. Rome was the last united kingdom. Along the way, the kingdoms have tried to unite. But God says at the end,